pray for us. Father, we thank you for a new day with these new precious mercies that you've delivered. Uh, some of us are very aware of needing your mercies. Others of us haven't really thought about it much yet, but, but we are all in need of your grace. So would you supply in full measure help for us, um, both hear your word, and understand your word, to obey your word, and to yeah, hope in you above all things. Lord, would you give give us uh, yeah, give us yourself this morning uh, as we, we draw near to you through your word. Help us. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, Ephesians 4 is where we are. It's in the second half of the book. First half, chapters 1 through 3, uh, instructs us about our identity in Christ, that we are in the world but not of the world. We are in Christ. Some 29 times our union with Jesus transforms everything about how we should understand ourselves in relationship to God, to others, and to the world. Um, and now in the second half of the book, chapters 4 through 6, we're talking about how we live. We saw in verses 1 through 16 of chapter 4 that we're to walk in unity. That's going to be fueled by humility and gentleness, Christ-like love, um, and that is for the aim of being built up uh, as a body where the Spirit is filling us, uh, helping us all to um, yeah, operate in the unique gifts that he's given to us uh, as a diverse body, um, yet as a unified uh, people, and we are building ourselves up in love. Then in this section that we're in now, 4, 17 through 32, we see that we are to walk in holiness. We're to not walk. He gives an example to avoid uh, in the as the Gentiles do, again, unbelievers um, and uh, who are alienated uh, from the life of God, darkened in their understanding. There's an ignorance that is in them. Not, again, as we talked about last time, this is not saying uh, unbelievers are not smart, uh, but rather there is a, a certain kind of ignorance, and ignorance to the spiritual life uh, that is rooted in their hardness of heart, verse 18. And they have become callous, or they're unfeeling toward God. Um, or any feeling that they do have is distorted and they don't understand it properly um, to where they can actually think that they're they and God are good, but the fact is they're actually enemies. Um, so that's a dangerous place uh, to be, and it leads them to give themselves up to sensuality and to greed and every kind of impurity. Um, but verse 20, he says, that's not the way the believers to walk. Um, that's not how we learn Christ. But rather, verse 22, and then he used the language of... Um, of what you do with a coat. You put off and you put on. Uh, you are to put off uh, your old manner of life uh, and its corrupt, deceitful desires. And you are to, by the power of the Spirit, put on the new self, which is being created, bless you, after the likeness of, of God. So the, the way you become human, if you will, truly human, uh, not that you aren't human before you're born again. You're human. You're creating God's image. But to be what humanity was created to be, to experience life as you were to experience, you need to put off sin because sin is destructive and de um, of self and ultimately relationship with God, which leads you away from who you were created to be. And we're to put on by the Spirit obedience in faith, um, pursuing God-likeness, holiness. We're to be set apart from sin, set apart to him. Uh, you be holy as I am holy. But if we pursue that, you experience what life is, is intended to be like as a, as, as a human. So we are being remade, if you will, into the likeness of God there at verse 24. So we should be looking more like Jesus um, day in and day out. And that is where joy, peace, um, and life comes from. And... He said, okay, so thanks for, the, thanks for the image of putting off, putting on, put off the old sinful desires, put on Christ's desires, if you will, and what Christ's likeness looks like. All right, can you give me some examples? And he says, sure, I'm happy to give you examples. I'll give you a bunch of them in verses 25 down through 32. And the first one in verse 25, uh, well, why don't we go ahead and read uh, 25 down through 32 again? Um, Somebody read that for us, and then we'll, we'll, we'll jump back in here. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry, do not sin, do not let the suffer down on your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for believing. Do not hear the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were 
seals were today of redemption. So all bitterness, wrath, and anger, clamor, and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. Good. So what he does here is he gives you five examples, um, five groups of examples of putting off and putting on. So this is a great uh, study of, of repentance. What does repentance look like? And you're going to see it's a stop doing one thing and start doing a different thing. So repentance is, just, is not just stop doing this and then now you're neutral, but it is a turning from and a turning to. So turning away from sin and a turning to God in active obedience, where before it was active disobedience, now you're going to be in active obedience. This one fueled by yeah, the passions of the flesh. This uh, fueled by uh, the, yeah, the faith in the spirit, and it's just totally the opposite way, right? So uh, we looked at two examples last time. The first there in verse 25, put off what in verse 25? Falsehood. Yeah, don't be lying. Okay, quit your lying. So put off falsehood and put on what? This, speaking the truth to one another. Right, so stop lying to one another. Tell one another the truth. Right, and he gives you a reason for we are members of one another. We're a, we're a body. We're a family. Right, so um, that's that's example number one. The second example was what? Be angry and not sin. Yep. Yep. So the putting off would be what? The sinful responses to anger which are, in your anger, do not sin, and do not let the sun go down in your anger, so you don't, you don't give in to sinful responses, and you don't stew in your anger and grow bitter, but rather, we're gonna go the opposite way. We are going to, to, to love, if you will, so we're not gonna, we're gonna not, we're intentionally not giving Satan an opportunity here, right? So there is going to deal with your anger appropriately in a way, rather than inappropriately, so, Yes, I'm, I'm angry. Lord, help me, right? Lord, help me to draw near to you. Help these um, awakened passions. It's highlighting something about my heart. Lord, help me, you know, to either pursue reconciliation with this person or to pursue forgiveness or to seek you in prayer for strength to endure with somebody versus, oh, yeah, well, and then you start cussing or hitting or whatever or withdrawing and, um, whatever your sinful response is. So stop, stop that response to anger and in your anger, do not sin. And now here in verse 28, we've got our next one. Um, we haven't looked at this one yet. So this is fresh, verse 28. Um, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. I think verse 28 is one of the most helpful examples of what repentance looks like. So in this section, we see, we see plenty of examples. This one's super duper clear in the way it's structured, okay? So help me see, first of all, um, what's, the, what's the old way that you're to put off? What's he say? Don't steal. Right, don't be stealing. What is stealing? Taking, what taking something that does not belong to you. That seems basic, does it? But uh, you'd be amazed how much people thieve it. Um, so you're taking something that does not belong to you. Um, okay. Uh, and, and why are you doing that? Okay, because you're covetous, you're desiring something, right? You may be stealing because you're you're poor and you need to survive, right? So there's there's that. Um, but typically, the reason we steal is because, well, because we're selfish, because we want something, and we think we are entitled, for whatever justified reason that we can come up with, to take something that we, yeah, don't, don't own, right? Um, it could be something from work, from a store, from a parent, um, 
you can be in school and steal grades by cheating, right? So there's, there's lots of ways that, that this can, can come up. You can steal positions from people by lying on your resume. There's 10,000 applications to thievery here. Um, I remember when I first became a Christian, well, I was in the middle of my junior years when I became a Christian. And to that point, I had, uh, I had, the way I had made it through school was cheating. That's all I, that's the only way I knew how to get a grade was I cheated on everything I ever did. Um, I mean, I studied some, but basically they were stolen tests uh, that, you know, knew the answers. It was just, it wasn't good, Karen. Um, and I remember after I became a Christian, all of a sudden I was like, well, two things happened. First of all, I wasn't doing nearly as many drugs, so it was amazing how much easier it was to read and to comprehend after you stopped smoking weed every day. It was incredible. Um, so that started, and I, I began reading and comprehending. Um, but then, all of a sudden, I remember my first test after I became a Christian. I was just sitting there. I was like, oh, no. I was like, what am I going to do? And... Yeah, I, I tried really hard to not cheat and made it about three quarters through the test. And I looked off of somebody next to me and stole an answer from him and just felt like the spirit just stabbed me right in the middle of this test. And I'm like, oh, this is terrible. So um, waited a day, tried to rationalize it and uh, went to set up an appointment with a professor, walked in, sat down and said, um, I need to confess to you that I, I cheated on my last test in your class. And he turned his head sideways and he said, what? I said, yeah, I need to, I've become a Christian and yeah, God, God wanted me to come in here and tell you that I, I stole answers from the person who was next to me and I cheated on your test. And he said, he was so confused and terrified. It was really interesting. He was, he goes, don't tell me anything else. Just go. <laughs> and don't, don't do that again. You know, it was just like, he didn't know what to do with honesty. He had never, I guess, I mean, or at least that kind of just the God language freaked him out or whatever it was. Um, but that was like, that was the beginning of learning to, to read and to, uh, to study and to do like normal things that you're supposed to do in school. And, that might be slightly hyperbolic, but not by much. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so that's just an example to where my way of life was just, that's what I did, right? Um, and before that, yeah, I mean, we, anyway, I used to be a thief, steal lots of stuff as a kid. Um, so he says here, let the thief steal no longer, but rather do what? Yeah, get a job, labor, right? The, the, the word that's used in the original language here, it's an exhausting sort of word. Go dig some ditches, go you know, mow some lawns, go do whatever you need to do. Whatever hustle you can come up with, an honest hustle, do it, right? Go, yeah, work. Um, use the hands that you used to use to steal from people and now employ them, work, so that you can honestly receive. So put on honest work, hard work. But notice here, it doesn't stop there, does it? Where does it go now? What's the, the so that tells you why you're doing it. So that what? So that you can now take the hands that used to steal from others, and now you can have, certainly for your own need, but beyond that, to now serve others. You see how your complete orientation toward people changes? Rather than using people with an entitled, self, entitled selfish posture that takes, now you're going to serve others by sacrificially giving of what is yours. It's a complete 180. This is a great verse on what repentance looks like. So anytime you're talking about what repentance looks like, you can use this as an example and say, okay, what might that look like in your life with whatever the sin is that you are uh, 
um, helping somebody to wrestle with. So, um, yeah, so stop, stop stealing and start being generous. And I, I think, you know, the, the great example here is of, of Christ, right, who gives himself for us. We are now emulating him um, rather than Satan who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Remember, all of these, by the way, you can trace most of this back to the difference of, of the way of life in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. When you're dead in your trespasses and sins and walked according to the course of the world following Satan, all of that manifests itself in all of these sins, right? Um, and now he's showing you how to walk a different way to walk the path of life that is from the Lord. Any question there about stealing? Question, comment, insight? Anything? Yep. Ken. Oh, yeah. So I've been talking to you before about what it is in self restraint. Um, stealing the meaning of work. And then just to uh, make some reference to that the fellow said that there's a little insecurity. Even when you were, you were with me, we used to be the new disorder. If anyone's not willing to work, we do not speak. Yep, so Second Thessalonians 2 gives us an exhortation if you don't work, you don't eat. All right, so there's a responsibility that believers are to, to have to not just, just take from others, but to actively engage as they're able, right? Obviously, there's certain circumstances where people are unable to work, and that's a whole other conversation, but the norm and the expectation. Yeah, and so many members of people don't So that's a good example. If it says no free refills and you get another refill, even if you can justify in your mind, well, they're marking it up 40%, so I at least could get, you know, a quarter of a cup and it's okay. You know, like as soon as you start justifying it, just realize that, yeah, that's that's stealing, right? Okay, you didn't, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, it's just a good example of little thing that we just don't, you know, It's a, it's a heart issue. It's good. Good. Any other comment? Yeah, maybe. I think a modern issue is like sharing Netflix passwords. Do you have okay. any thoughts on that? Kind of so thing? Nathan brings up a question about sharing passwords to subscriptions. Um, yeah, what I would say is the answer is, what does the company think you're paying for? I mean, what did you, what did you, because believe it or not, I, I understand nobody reads small print, but it's there. Um, and all of that are the honor code to what you're signing up for. So do you know, what, so for instance, credit card, does anybody know what that, what that comes from, what the word for credit is? Credo. You're giving your word that you're going to pay this money back that you're borrowing. So it's all supposed to be honor system, right? So the same kind of thing. Like if you, yeah, if you have Netflix password or YouTube TV or whatever it may be, and you didn't pay for it, but you're using it like you did. If the company, like if you were having the CEO of the company over for dinner and you turned on your subscription and they said, oh, when did you subscribe? Well, actually I didn't. It's a friend's password. I'm stealing from you. Like that's a real thing. Like they're actually humans. And I understand they make a lot more money and they know what to do with and all that kind of that's that's not the issue though. As soon as you start justifying it, you know, so just yeah, don't don't steal. Yeah. See when I was a kid, back when I was a kid, we used to uh, you would yeah, you could steal music and videos and all that kind of stuff. I'm sure you can still do that now. Um, but uh, 
yeah, copying things that you don't have, you didn't pay for, all of that. Napster. Napster, that's what it was. That's it. Oh. Thiefster. So there is steel and everything. Yeah. Yeah, Napster. Anyway. May the Lord guide you in all of your repentance. <laughs> Verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for the building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So now we'll go to our, our words. So put off what? Corrupting talk. Uh, the word is used unwhole or unwholesome, right? Um, is that how they, N-A-S, yeah, so unwholesome. It's, it's, it means rotten. It's used of, the, the word is used of rotten trees, uh, rotten fish, rotten fruit, right? Um, put off whatever that sort of corrupting talk is. So it's, it's vile, um, base, yeah, un, ungodly talk, right? It is uh, slander, gossip, cursing, crudeness. It's how you feel if you've been reading your Bible and then you watch TMZ. And when you're done that, you're like, ew, I just feel dirty. You know, not that I'm watching TMZ, but if you were. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you, you, you can watch. Sometimes when you watch a movie and you're done watching, you're like, ew. I did not feel better after watching that. Um, whatever that sort of thing is, that's what unwholesomeness is. Right? It's it's the words and talk you wouldn't have in front of um, your grandma if she loved Jesus. You know, you'll see talk like that around me. You know, whatever that whatever that God was your grandma was like. But um, if you had that kind of grandma um, who you know was a holy woman um, who would you know do you, you wouldn't say certain. sitting there, right? He says, don't let that come out of your, your mouth. So in our, in our home, it's potty talk. The kids, for whatever reason, they just have the gift of bringing everything back to the bathroom. Um, I don't know what it is, but it's just a unique ability that children have to relate everything back to the restroom. Um, so we are, we're trying to help them understand to not have potty talk. And um, uh, <laughs> so, but we all have that, right, in different ways. Oftentimes with gossip and slander, that which was tears down, that if the person you're talking about was sitting there with you, it would not smell good, if you will. It would be hurtful, demoralizing, not, not putting people in a good light, talking about what people look like or what they're like or this or that or whatever it may be, right? So that's dangerous talk. It comes from a heart that is yeah, not honoring to God or to, to others, right? So put off your corrupting talk. And uh, so let no corrupting talk about your house, but only such as is good, right? For what purpose? Yeah. Hey. Yeah, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear for building up. So it's the word that's used for um, yeah, uh, 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 making a house, building a house, like you're, you're creating a house, you're nailing things together to, for the sake of edification, for building up, which is the opposite of something that's rotting, right? So corrupting, rotting talk versus edifying, building up talk. Um, so when you speak, the idea is that grace-filled words are coming out of your mouth in a way that, notice here, what does he say there about as fits the occasion? What's he, what's that mean? It's easy to just read over, but what, what is, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion. What does that mean? Good. So fits the occasion in the need of the moment. What does that imply about your, your speaking? 
Okay, what's necessary? Some things are like appropriate to say in certain settings or not. Like Good. Great. Yeah, so it requires thinking. It requires a thoughtfulness that is in tune with someone and what's going on with them that's not careless and flippant, which is often where the uncorrupt or the corruptible words come from. Just flippant nonsense that you're just, that Jesus said you'll give an account for every one of those words. But, but rather it's a, I'm thinking about you and I'm observing something's going on. So I want to give a word to you that is grace filled for the purpose of giving life encouraging, building up, strengthening um, as, you, as you need it, right? So such as good for building up this bits of occasion that it may give grace to those who hear, right? So in the same way that if you walk in and two friends are gossiping about you and what that does to you, it tears down, saps your soul, this is the opposite of that. This is, you walk in and two people are talking about how much God has used you to bless them. That's the kind of gossip you like to walk in on. You're like, oh, stop it. Lord, can you start over? Uh, uh, right? So, I mean, there's a difference to the way that it lands on you. Words, you know, life and death are in the tongue, Proverbs said. It can give life, it can steal life, or sap it, right? So, words are... Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great example. First that's four fourteen, right? Yeah. So there's there's thoughtfulness with different people in different situations and what you might say or how you might say. That's great. So every word Jesus says matters, right? Matthew 12, I think it's 12, 30 something, but I've been wrong a lot already today. Uh, pretty close. All right, 1236 on the, uh, well, I'll just go back for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. For I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. Every word matters. For by your words you will be justified, by your words will be condemned. Meaning, your, evi your, your words evidence what's going on in here. Right? It's, just, it's evidence. Good. There, Psalm 1914. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Right? So we, the idea here is we're thinking about who we're, what we're speaking with the intent of trying to help others. Okay. Yeah. What are your thoughts on You have more Netflix questions. People are already mad at you. Um, <laughs> but this is good. Do you have thoughts on sarcasm and if it is ever appropriate. Great. The question is, do I have thoughts on sarcasm? And if I think it's ever appropriate. How many of you have the gift of sarcasm? Yes. How many of you have ever used your gift uh, in a way that's been funny and people seem to enjoy? How many of you have ever used your gift and it's hurt people? Yeah, there you go. So, uh, <laughs> sarcasm is a form of humor that when properly used, can be, do what humor does. It shows a ironic side of reality that evokes joy, okay? That's what humor is, right? Um, but it can also be cutting in a way that is unhelpful and unloving. 
that can be sharp because oftentimes um, there's particularly with couples uh, that I see like if couples are dating or just are married who who enjoy kidding with each other uh, especially if they're dating and like they're they want to you know you have any advice on a relationship um, well one of the early bits of advice would be like be careful with your joking with each other that's cute while you're dating for like a couple minutes but eventually uh, if that's like everything for the rest of your life you're gonna hurt one another and you're gonna really begin to it's gonna be sharp so every if you have a relationship that that's your common tongue is is just sarcasm you're gonna find it does a couple things one eventually you're going to hurt somebody with it there's gonna be over steps because yeah, there's something about ramping up humor that we feel whatever kind of can incite that a little bit another thing it's going to do is it's you're going to probably be using that form of speaking at the expense of being uh a a grace grace giver or thoughtful and what it's going to do is your stock is going to go down in regards to people wanting to hear from you or you being the one that people are going to come to in times of distress because so I, I have a friend uh i should ask him before i use his name but i have a friend who is super gifted as a pastor but he was for i'd say years known as being the funny guy and he's hilarious he is hilarious but he used it way too much to where I told him one time that I think people are going to not be taking you seriously. Um, so you've got to know how and when to appropriately use it or otherwise people are just going to think you don't think heavily. I know you think about life in weighty ways that are meaningful and you've got a lot to give, but I think people aren't going to think of you in that way. So your opportunity for edification is going to go down and then yeah, that kind of stuff. So, all of that matters. I don't know if that helps at all. It's hard. It is hard. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's hard, isn't it? Yeah. Questions about cancel culture and how believers should handle themselves in it. Hmm. Well, I think before you engage in conversations, you should be prayerful and you should memorize a verse like this. And I think you can be an example of how to not, not be that. The, the temptation is to respond with evil, respond to evil with evil. Be like, oh, you're going to do that? Well, I do that too, right? So, um, yeah, uh, so for me personally, I think the area I exercise this most is when I'm on social media. So I, I've deleted more tweets than I tweeted, which is saying a lot because I post a lot of things over the years, but I've not said a lot of things and withheld things. And I, anytime I'm responding to someone who's being uh, adversarial in, in replies, I will couch things like, hey, thanks for your question. It's an important thing to wonder. Um, here's my thinking on it. Um, I try to be charitable, gentle, thoughtful. I can't tell you how many uh, times I've had people reach back out and say, hey, thank you for that. Um, I came at you hot and I shouldn't have or whatever, those kinds of things. Um, I think one of the advantages believers have in our day is the backdrop of cancel culture, like, you know, just roasting people, all that kind of stuff. Kindness really stands out. Charitableness stands out. Um, so anytime that I do say something a little too snarky, I'll get, I'll get other people who'd be like, Hey, you're usually a good example of that. I felt like this was a little much. Like, yeah, you're probably right. Um, and be correctable and humble and all that kind of stuff. So 
I think understand that there's opportunity and you'll, you'll feel like you're going to be overlooked because what gets attention is, you know, the meme of taking somebody's head and put it on a baby's body and like that gets, you know, clicks and applause and stuff. But like, if you're not the one who's doing that, it will endear people to you over time. So take the long view, be gentle, speak to them as someone who's made in God's image, who will spend eternity in heaven or hell, and that you are going to affect the way they're thinking about Jesus. And that matters. So I think keep everything vertically oriented in that sense. And I find that to be helpful. Yeah. So don't cancel people. Yeah, with, with that, I'm always encouraged to think about that looking at Hebrews 11. Forever and the over of and all those people we can also see the deliberate sin, the evil that they've done, and they will hold people accountable at the end. But God still gives them this like this accomplished result. I don't just find it, especially with the gospel. I don't just find it. It's good. Yeah. So remembering that God doesn't cancel them, if you will, and that we all can like measure. Yeah. I don't want to keep on it, but I, you can decide whether that answers that. I feel like we can go on and on to examples of you know, when it came to the Muslim talk. I was just interested to know as far as cussing and then even that, that alone and also cussing in the context of music. Because I've had different discussions with Christians on both of those yeah. topics. Great. So should Christians curse and can we sing along the songs that have curse words in them? Basically. Yeah, sing along or even play them publicly. Play them. Or both of those types of things. Yeah, uh, so Christians recently have wanted to, so I think where it flows from, the, the custom Christian thing, I think it flows from we don't want to be viewed as the legalistic uh, Christian who can't be who we are, like that sort of posture. Um, uh, I think it's a mark of immaturity to not be able to hold your tongue. Um, and yeah, so I don't think an evidence is actually maturity to be like, I'm kind of above that. So I can, I can drop bombs here and there, uh, or all the time to make a, make a point. Um, I think if, if your general thing is, I want to kind of show everybody that I'm above, then that's, that's obviously rooted in pride. Right? I think it also matters what you're saying and why you're saying it. You know, I mean, it's like on Sunday, I used two curse words, hell and damn, but I explained what they meant um, in the context of the final judgment and why, yeah, how even those, those words um, yeah, I've been enlightened by turning them into expletives, right? Certainly, yeah, last for me, taking Jesus' name or God's name in vain. So I think, like, for instance, OMG, I think if you mean, oh my gosh, not everybody knows you do. So I would say, I don't think you should say that because everybody else hears it as blasphemy. Are you taking God's name lightly? You're, you're making it a, a three letter, you know, oh wow, you know, just say oh wow. Um, I think that's helpful. So, um, yeah, I, I don't want to go overboard and, and say, you know, that it's the greatest of sins. I, I think you want to check hearts, you know, um, be, be thoughtful. Now, I think if your thing is that, like, I'm free to do this, yeah, I think. Freedoms is where maturity or immaturity often shows up the most. It's like when you're free to do something, can you actually be trusted? Or do you just think that looking like the world is cool kind of thing, right? So in regards to music, uh, I would think a way to love your neighbor, first of all, is so I, I don't want my kids learning certain words. I mean, they're learning them all right now, but because the people, the schools and you know, sports teams and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but I don't want my neighbor blasting, you know, whomever um, with profanity, 
place things. So I think it's, as a believer, I would encourage you to be, be mindful of, of that. Um, and then for, for me, I personally have to, there's, there's music I just can't listen to anymore. It, it evokes things in me, you know, to where there's certain, certain, believe it or not, uh, I mean, gangster rap is all I used to listen to. So uh, when I listen to certain stuff, it, it evokes me either wanting to hit people or takes me back to the club or whatever, you know what I mean? Like it's my world, it, it, what it brings out of me is not like, I'm a god. It's like, yeah, whatever that is, right? So yeah, whenever that starts going in me, I'm like, that's weird and I don't like that. So uh, it doesn't help me see Jesus, so. Yes? Um, actually, this song, it's called Strong, and I just I think it's a great categorization. So I've, I've, I've attempted to have some of those conversations with my kids and being like, okay, well, let me tell you what that word means and why we would say that saying it is not something that's going to be honoring to God, right? And I think it's a great way to think about those two, two categories because that's generally. So thank you. What about replacement cuss words? What about replacement <laughs> This is the best. So when I became a Christian, I got so creative with language because all I all I knew how to do in my talking was cuts. I mean, I was a creative person. You know, I mean, like where you would use a, ver a word as a verb, adjective, noun, all in the same sentence, and it just that's just all I ever did. Like, um, and then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit's like, "What do you talk like? Jesus wouldn't talk like that." But I'm used to my sentences being filled with all sorts of colorful things. So I would then begin to, to fill them in with, you know, oh donkey or whatever. You just like strange things. I remember the first, it was very strange there for a while. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I don't know. I'm just trying not to cuss anymore. And it was, it was so weird, right? Um, but then, you know, like, so in our house, for instance, our kids, uh, um, darn it. I'm like, we're not, don't, I was like, don't, let me explain to you why. It's basically the same sort of line as this. Oh, shoot. Like, nah, same sort of thing. Um, or, or you're, you know, yeah. you're a bee, like, mm, let me tell you what that means. So like, and they're picking up things from other kids as well. So I'm like, let me explain to you what, no. So I, I think what it's doing is it's doing the same thing. So even in our house, uh, oh my gosh, no. I'm like, kids, let me tell you why. That's a, it's the same sort of art kind of thing that's going on. Oh goodness, for me, is different than oh my gosh because of proximity toward where your mind goes kind of thing. This is just how we're trying to coach our kids into what we're thinking about. So I think the issue, the issue is a heart issue. We want to think about what's happening in your heart. Um, so I, what I don't want to do is just get, is to get legalistic and say, this is, you can't say this. You can't say, oh my gosh, I'm not going to say that. I think it's better certainly than saying the other. Uh, I think it's, I think it's an issue of why, why is it important for you to go there? How is it, you know, if it's keeping you from saying something else, if it's training wheels, great. But if you're, yeah, I think we can just do better and be a model of how to be thoughtful, mindful speakers who give grace. So, thanks. Everybody's going to take Nathan out for coffee after this. This is going to be good. <laughs> Great questions, brother. I saw another hand over here. I think it's good to slow down. So this is why Bible time, I think it's one of the things about this kind of study is helpful because you can just slow down and talk about stuff that this is, we're thinking about these things all the time. These are, these are, these are important. So, not the other, sorry. Oh yeah, Chris. Um, I'm curious about the 
there's other supplies there, but I feel like um, there's a lot of like more nutrition that my mom and I would go do before you would rest. It's like uh, Christian related or maybe you understand what I'm saying. I'm um, having a hard time with it. But um, I just had a few words about um, it was like it seemed like that's a lot of what our country is about. There's like in a way like oh you sinner or give each other a hard time. More so than I think it really should be. Yeah. So I feel like Yeah, so I think it's in some same vein as a lot of the stuff. I think I think would ask why are we saying what we're saying. So yeah, so even the like, oh you big sinner, or or like the the point that I made on Sunday about Christians that hell's not a joke. So like, I don't think Christians should ever joke about hell. But certainly when I was in college ministry, I mean that was the thing. You know, like oh you're gonna you know we're sing the Revelation song. About what happens to liars and like different it's just uh if you haven't heard it don't worry about it you're not listening but like um you know it's yeah i mean so oh you big sinner I, it's just not funny like what what because what sin is it breaks god's heart it put his son on the cross and i think we should just be, just be mindful of what you're saying we are we have been trained to be flippant with words it's just flippancy is yeah it's i mean we're yeah, we're, our, our culture is yeah, we're not as thoughtful as we should be. Christians should be the most thoughtful people who realize that everything I say is going to honor and dishonor God. And listen, I am really temptable in this area because I, I mean, it's yeah, my, my natural love language is jesting and saying, making light of stuff and like I could, yeah. So I understand and I think we should be patient with each other and um, but I think having these kinds of conversations can be helpful. So hopefully somebody in here will stop doing the OMG thing because of what we talked about today. And I think that's a little crazy. Um, you know, or we'll be like, you know, I should be more thoughtful about this. Or that. And I just think that's what we want to help. So this is why this, so we have Bible time so that you can take these kinds of things and say, Hey, we had a really good conversation, uh, at Bible time about talk about our speech. I'd love for some of us to get together. Why don't we, why don't we read over this? Let's grab some other problems. Everybody bring a verse that has to do with speech. Let's talk about it. And then let's say, hey, what are some ways that we can, we need to confess some stuff? What are some things we can pray for one another about? What are ways we can, we can help each other? So, yeah. The second, the second part. So how, what's the common way to respond to friends who aren't well with friends, but also are our fellow believers in Christ? Yeah, so how do we, how do we do that? So how do we respond to believers who are unbelievers in this? So let's start with the unbelievers. I, as I tell my, so what, what am my, so I coach some kids soccer teams and some of those kiddos do some colorful language. If I hear it, I'm going to say to them, hey, guys, I don't want to hear that, that talk here. But normally, it's them with each other. And that's where I explain to my, my son, because he'll be like, they said this. I was like, I understand. I was like, so first of all, you got to remember, unbelievers are going to do what unbelievers do. So our job is not to moralize everyone. Um, so I think, first of all, you want to not emulate it. Realize that it's not, it's not good. It doesn't honor the Lord. I think it's fine for you then also to say, hey, could you try not to cuss so much, you know, and we try to do that. And I think that same sort of thing happens in our, in our relationship. Now, again, if we're at work and we are, if we're a superior, I think we can say, Hey, you know, in our office, uh, I'd like us to, to be mindful of the way that we're using our language. Not everybody here wants to hear the cursing. If you have that sort of authority, you can use it for good without being like, now Jesus says that you're going to give every, like there's, there's boundaries and you got to be thoughtful about that. But I think you can, now if you're, um, you know, not in a place of authority, 
sometimes you just got to put up with stuff and uh, you can just pray, Lord, help me to not jump in on it as well. Though for me, the boundary for me was always um, conversations that were demoralizing about either race, like so making racial jokes, or which, you know, in this day and age, it's, that's not going to fly uh, nearly as it used to, or making jokes, uh, guys with jokes about women and, you know, vile things and all that to where I'd be like, fellas, like, you just, you can't talk like that about ladies. And they'll be like, man, you know, and just let them do the thing. And that's, but I think I want to be the conscience in the room in that sense to where I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be doing that. But I also want to say, hey, we can't talk like that. And if they're like, well, then you're not invited. Well, then fine, you're not invited. And that's, there will, there will be that kind of thing. So all that to say, unbelievers are going to do what unbelievers are going to do. I think it's fine for you to, well, not fine. I think it should be a model of how to not engage. And I think it's also, yeah, helpful to, um, if it's a really public thing and you're like, I don't want to be a part of that, then you can, you can say something publicly or you can oftentimes just to the side, hey, listen, today, you know, the break room, this was going on. And I just, you know, it's hard for me to hear that kind of stuff. So I often do that with the Lord's name. The places I'm most proactive about that is when people are taking the Lord's name in vain. So when I'm playing basketball and somebody, you know, calls upon the Lord, but they're not calling upon him, you know what I'm saying? Um, I'll say, hey, just so you know, uh, unless you see Jesus, I'd appreciate, like, like, let's not take his name in vain. Don't look at me weird. And uh, I'll just I'll just keep saying it to them. I'll be like, hey, don't want to hear it. Um, and eventually, they'll either, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't care. I'll be that guy. So, um, so that that is something that I will. If they feel freedom to say it, I feel freedom to say, hey, I don't want to hear it. Um, or Jesus loves you. That, that one freaks them out sometimes. <laughs> they're like, they're like, oh, Jesus, Jesus loves you. <laughs> like, we can't be like that. They'll, they'll, they'll stop saying it at some point. So you got to figure out what your own thing is in that. Um, with, uh, with believers, uh, it's cheesy, but maybe, but it, I'm happy to do it. Um, and the reason why I do that is I had a coach. When I was a non-believing cussing fool, um, I had a coach who never cursed, and he had a replacement word. His was "dagum," whatever he would mean. "Dagum," um, which I asked him one time, like, "Why do you always say "dagum"?" He goes, "Because I really want to cuss, but it wouldn't honor God, so I'm trying not to." To which I was like, hmm. and that stuck with me. It was one of the things the Lord brought to mind when I got converted that He used to actually put on my radar that there's another way to live. I think with believers, um, you want to not shame one another. So if people are out and they're just acting a fool, but I, yeah, I have been super encouraged. So for instance, there was there was a conversation that I was privy to uh, recently where somebody said something about somebody else, and somebody else said something that was unkind about that person. This person circled back with. Um, with a, with a text message just saying, hey, I want you to know that I felt like the way that you talked about this brother or sister in Christ wasn't wasn't kind. And I'm actually good friends with that person. And it hurt my heart. And I know it would have hurt theirs if they hurt it. And it it messed with that person like a really good way to where they came back and said, hey, you know what? I, I thank you for saying that. That has wrecked me. And I've really got to be careful with the way that I talk. Like that kind of thing is helpful. So don't be cowardly with each other and trying to be like, oh, I just want to not ruffle feathers. I think the posture of gentleness, especially if you're a person who's able to be corrected, like that kind of stuff is really, it's helpful. So that's what Christians do. And I think I just encourage all of you to not be offended if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I noticed the way you were using your words was this way or that way. Like we want that with each other. If you want to grow in godliness, yeah. Now at the same time, don't be the, you know, the poo patrol to where like anytime you hear any kind of thing, like you're like, oh, hey, listen, like don't just be that person all the time. Be thoughtful in relationship. Pray for wisdom about when and how to to, to engage in, in those kinds of conversations. Is that helpful? We're on it. We might as well stay here. Yes, and then yes. The, the... I think you kind of touched on this when you talked about the pastor and trying to be funny. But I, I found that habits of sarcasm or humor or wit can replace another form of communication. So that used to be a real issue in my family between siblings. We 
were so many extremely sarcastic and mean, and in order to jump in on the conversation, you had to have something really smart and funny to say. Um, and we couldn't be genuine with each other. And I think it had to do with um, just dependence on if we wanted to give a compliment, then it would have to be some sort of backhanded semi compliment that could have been taken either way, or at least it's somehow too vulnerable. Yeah. So I think that that kind of habit can uh, really hamper our ability to encourage and communicate genuinely. And it also can, in other circumstances like this, um, it, it seems like there's a real connection when it's just humor. You yeah. can bond with someone over sure. gossip. That's not a real connection. Mm -hmm. yeah. The same way you can bond with someone over humor. I've lost entire friend groups that I thought were real friends. And I realized that the only thing we had in common was we ate, ate together and we laughed together. Yeah. And then once those things were gone, it was just. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a good word. And I think it can feel awkward to be encouraging. It, it, it feels a little embarrassing sometimes. To, to say, hey, I just want to point out, I think you do this really well. But when you learn to begin to use that muscle, it, it changes. It's not as embarrassing. And you'll find that it's life-giving and it helps people. So that's good. Alex? Oh, I was just thinking, like, to a mate's question. There are times where, like, if people at work know you're a Christian, they'll cuss and they'll be like, oh, sorry, like, I know you're a Christian. And they'll apologize. <laughs> Or like even other believers, like they'll cuss and be like, "Oh crap! I, oh, gee, oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh! Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lord, I need grace. Please give it. Um, <laughs> but like, yeah, that happened. Yeah. And I think that like we're, I know that I'm very quick to be like, I just kind of shrug it off because I don't want them to feel awkward about it. I don't want them to feel like any tension. But one way, as you were talking, I was thinking like, oh, this would be a good way just to be a witness is to say like, thank you when they apologize yeah. to me at work for cussing or when I'm with a brother or sister and they cuss and then they say, oh man, I shouldn't have said that to be like, yeah. And let's like ask the Lord for grace for us to like speak yeah. well and wholesome instead of just being quick to say it's okay don't worry about it yep i think that's great that that impulse to say don't worry about it i think i think it is not where you need to feel guilty now i think it can be a missed opportunity right so you have to remember that one of the things the lord has given every human is a conscience and so they actually used to call me the conscience um at uh this this restaurant that i worked at i was a i was a newish believer and you know, everybody, if you ever worked in a restaurant, it's, well, it's just a different kind of way of life. And um, I was, that was the conscience. And, um, but not in a way that I was calling people out. I would just be there. I would be standing there. Somebody drop an F-bomb and they look at it and they're like, hey, sorry about that. <laughs> you know, you know, it's like, I didn't say anything. I felt that same impulse to be like, oh, it's okay. You know, because you want to not be that, that kind of Christian who they assume is looking down on them. To where I think sometimes it's helpful to communicate. So, like, if that if that happens out in front of everybody, you want to just be careful to not be like have that moment where you know, okay, well, let's go deep right here. But but what I I will do is I'll circle back with that person. And I'll say, hey, I just want to say a couple of things to you. First of all, I want you to know that I like I'm not looking down on you. Um, so I know when you cursed today, you said, oh, hey, I'm sorry. I just want you to know I'm not sitting over here judging you. Me judging you is not what you have to worry about. Um, because I'm, I'm a sinner just like you are, and I need God's help. I said, <clears throat> but I also want you to know that the reason you feel that is because God's given you a conscience. And me being around for whatever reason is putting on your radar that there is actually something that's holy. And like, God, God is holy. And everything that we say is actually in his presence. So I just want you to know that like the reason you feel that isn't just because I'm around, but it's actually because God has given you a conscience. And I think he's using, I think he's working on you. And I would just encourage you to not ignore that. So then what you've done is you've let him know, hey, I'm not the one you've got to worry about. I'm, I'm here with you as a fellow person. I'm not going to not like you because you do certain things. I'm going to try to. 
but then you do alert them to the fact that, oh, this is the Lord. So if any other time that they've grown maybe dull to something that's happening and they feel guilty about something else, they're like, oh, maybe that's that same thing. And then they'll begin to potentially see how their conscience is being awakened by God's grace to all sorts of sins in their life, uh, which is one of the things that the Lord used in, in, in me um, to, to draw, draw me to himself. So that's good. Well, that was not what I thought we were going to do this morning, but I'm glad. So I hope that was helpful. Um, yeah, I think if there's things that you need to think about in regards to the way you use words, bring them to the Lord. If, if you sense that, hey, in your friends' circles, that it would be good for you to say, hey, listen, we had this conversation today in Bible time. I really needed to hear it, and I just wanted to say, hey, I, I need to apologize for this or that. Or if, uh, yeah, there's other people who uh, you're like, I wish they were here for this, you know, guard your heart from self-righteousness there. But also, uh, it's fine to circle back and say, hey, this Bible time that's recorded, uh, you can watch, and uh, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about it, but um, yeah, and, and I do think, if, you know, so here's your permission slip to just be, to do what Christians can do, which is, hey, we'd love to get some, ver we want to talk about how we're talking, so we're going to have a campfire over at somebody's house or whatever, everybody want to come over, bring a verse about your speech, and let's share, and then let's talk about it, and let's see how can we grow in, in the way we honor God with our words, like, that's a normal Christian thing to do. So I encourage you to use your time and your words well in that way. Karen, would you pray for us and ask God to help us with our tongues? Dear God, thank you so much for this time together this morning in your word and with those who, who are seeking to follow you. Lord, I ask that you would guard our tongues, guard our hearts first so that our tongues can reflect more and more of who you are and how you relate to one another. Let our words draw each other in. Let them be kind. Let them, uh, let them be a constant reminder of uh, who we want to honor. Lord, thank you for this day. Please keep praising you. Amen. Maybe I'll see you tomorrow night for Bible Boot Camp. And if not, then... Maybe I'll see you on Sunday. And if not, then maybe I'll see you next week. So, God bless you.